Hello, my name is Natalie Westfall, Vice President of Henry Schein Financial Services. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Henry Schein has been a trusted source of valuable information for our customers. We've provided valuable education and real-time updates on the CARES Act stimulus package. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has released several tranches of funding to various categories of providers, and on June 9th, it was announced that $15 billion of the Provider Relief Fund would be allocated to eligible Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program providers. Joining us today is King & Spalding's Mark Polston and Allison Kassir, who will provide us with an in-depth overview of the Provider Relief Fund created in the CARES Act. Thank you so much. We appreciate the time and the opportunity to be here. We wanted to level set and put this slide up just to outline the congressional response to the COVID-19 public health emergency, just so that we could see all of the billions in one place. Um, you will see how the funding evolved from response and vaccine development to supportive provisions for individuals to stimulus package and its plus up. With some of the provisions in these bills expiring at the end of July, there may yet be a COVID package, COVID-4 package in the next several weeks. The House passed their Health and Economic Recovery Omnibus Emergency Solutions Act, or HEROES Act, in mid-May. The Senate is not likely to take up that bill, but Senate leadership has expressed a desire to take a look at the funding that has gone out the door, see if it's working, and also include expanded liability protections. Um, note that the program we are discussing here does not expire at the end of July. It is something where Congress put the funding in and the program, as Mark will describe in detail, has evolved um, into various tranches, various requirements, um, and with that, let me turn it over to Mark to describe the Provider Relief Fund created in the CARES Act originally. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, as Allison said, the, the CARES Act um, funded to the tune initially of $100 million and then an additional $75 billion, I'm sorry, I should have said $100 billion initially, uh, and then an additional $75 billion were appropriated by Congress to go into uh, what has been uh, commonly called the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund. Now, the purpose of the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund was to provide stimulus through grants or other types of mechanisms uh, to healthcare providers who were feeling the effects of the public health and public health uh, emergency was caused by the coronavirus pandemic. The statute itself um, in the language uh, that, is, that appropriates the $175 billion states that the purpose of the program is to provide these funds to prevent, to prepare for, and to respond to the coronavirus and to give eligible healthcare providers, we're gonna talk about what that means in a second, to give eligible healthcare providers the funds necessary um, to cover the expenses or lost revenues that are attributable to the coronavirus. Now, one limitation that's built into the statute, and we'll hear about this throughout the program, is that these funds must only be used uh, to reimburse for expenses or losses that are used, excuse me, that have been, uh, that have been incurred due to the coronavirus. But if there's another source of funding out there, whether it be the CARES Act um, itself, or some other federal source of funding, uh, which can be used uh, to cover those expenses or losses. CARES Act funding cannot be used to cover those same expenses or losses. In other words, the CARES Act does not allow you to double dip um, from federal programs. Let's talk a little bit about the definition of eligible healthcare providers, um, because literally when you read the language of the statute, you realize that um, just about anybody who provides healthcare services in the United States could be determined to be an eligible healthcare provider under the CARES Act statute and the appropriations language. Uh, it means any public entity, anybody who's enrolled in the Medicare or Medicaid program, whether they're a, a hospital provider, whether a physician, whether a supplier um, of, of medical services such as DME um, services, uh, and of course, dental, ser uh, dental services would, would 
uh, clearly fall within this very, very broad uh, definition of eligible health care providers. Um, what is uh, interesting and what we'll touch upon a little bit later in the slide is that it's not just that you have to be an eligible health care provider to be eligible for these funds, but you have to be one that is provided uh, diagnoses, testing, or care for individuals with possible or actual cases of COVID. Now, we'll focus in on the word possible because possible um, is interpreted very broadly by the Department of Health and Human Services. And their view is that um, any patient uh, today who you might provide services to, healthcare services to, is a possible COVID patient because they could be infected without you knowing it. So we're to be treated as a possible COVID patient. Um, <clears throat> that's different. We'll talk a little bit about somebody who is a presumptive COVID patient because one of the requirements for receiving these funds involves um, how you must bill uh, for patients who are presumptive COVID patients. There are two different definitions and we'll get into that in a bit. So that's generally go back to, you know, March of this year when Congress created the Provider Relief Fund. There is now is a hundred billion dollars that it needed to distribute. Um, and the, the agency wanted to act very quickly. It wanted to act rapidly. Um, it wanted to get funds out there to the healthcare community because it understood, um, that the healthcare community was suffering, uh, both from the expenses that it was incurring in order to address the coronavirus epidemic, such as purchasing PPE, um, creating new facilities temporarily where people could be treated, creating drive-by um, locations for testing. All those things were, were increasing expenses, but perhaps um, most significantly because of the need for social distancing and the, because of the need to um, keep people from congregating in places where they might infect each other, um, many states uh, in fact, I think literally every state in the union was under an order to um, to stop doing unnecessary or, excuse me, non-urgent um, health care services. And as a result, all health care providers, whether they be hospitals, physicians, uh, suppliers of durable medical equipment, or dental providers, for example, uh, suddenly found that they could no longer um, perform the services that they were doing. So these so-called elective procedures were halted which meant extensive amounts of lost revenue. The agency wanted to respond quickly to that. And so the first step that it took uh, was in April was to get out uh, as much money as possible in what they called the first round of general distribution. Um, what the agency did um, with the first round of general distribution was it took $30 billion and it gave $30 billion uh, uh, without any application being required to nearly 320,000 um, healthcare providers who had been uh, paid under the Medicare fee-for-service program for some type of services in 2019. Um, that was a significantly large group of providers that included hospitals, that included um, nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, home health agencies, physicians. Um, if you had provided some sort of services and were paid for them from the Medicare program in, in 2019, then you receive some um, amount of money under this uh, $30 billion, what's been called the first tranche of the Provider Relief Fund general distribution. Uh, significantly, because many dental providers, um, of course, the, the Medicare program does not generally cover dental services, um, but the Medicaid program is far more generous in terms of the coverage of dental services. So as a result, um, almost all dental providers were left out um, of this first uh, tranche of general distribution. Um, in addition to there being um, some concern about uh, providers who, like dental providers, um, did not receive Medicare, uh, excuse me, did not provide Medicare services and therefore uh, missed out on uh, some of the distribution, um, a number of providers in the country uh, were immediately critical, <clears throat> excuse me, of the agency um, for distributing the funds based upon um, past uh, receipts of Medicare funding. Many hospitals who were in so-called COVID hot zones at that time, uh, New York, Detroit, um, and, and, another, and New Orleans, for example, uh, were critical because they needed, they felt the funds, um, a, a larger distribution of the funds 
and they wanted to see that the funds uh, got distributed to hotspots. In addition, um, as we said before, uh, large Medicaid providers were left out, not only dental providers, but also children's hospitals um, who have a very, very, very low um, Medicare patient load. Um, so as a result, um, the agency uh, decided to issue a second round of general distribution funds called the, we'll call it the second tranche of funding uh, in April of, uh, late April of this year. And essentially what the agency did at that point in time was to say, um, we've distributed $30 billion. We're going to distribute an additional $20 billion uh, to the same sets of providers uh, who receive the general distribution funds. But we're going to um, base their share of payments on um, not just uh, their Medicare fee-for-service billing, but we're going to base that upon their, uh, their gross patient receipts or their gross patient revenues. Um, so a second round of $20 billion was distributed um, to those providers who received funds in the first general distribution. Um, now, again, uh, what being left out of those rounds uh, were the, the Medicaid providers like dental providers and children's hospitals who had not received that round, excuse me, funding through the first round. I've described the agency's um, decisions about how to uh, distribute the 100, now $175 billion of, of CARES Act provider relief funds as really sort of a policy decision upon, uh, on the part of the agency. And, and what I mean by that is that the agency, you know, as we talked about the statutory language at the beginning of the session, you see there were really no rules um, as to who the money should go to. It should go to every uh, eligible provider, which is defined as any provider who treated um, a possible COVID patient and who also uh, incurred expenses and lost revenue as a result. The agency um, through the past three months has essentially um, distributed this money in specific um, rounds of funding that are targeted to certain types of providers, um, much of it reflecting the agency's sort of policy, um, uh, you know, desires to impact the policy under uh, the healthcare programs. So, for example, um, in the early May, um, CMS announced, excuse me, HHS announced that it would distribute an additional um, $10 billion uh, to almost 400, excuse me, 4,000 rural healthcare providers uh, in the country. Uh, that included hospitals, rural health clinics, and rural health centers. Politically and policy-wise, uh, that was significant for this agency, which, you know, excuse me, for this administration, uh, which wants to send the message that it cares about rural providers. Uh, and so it targeted $10 billion of funds uh, to those rural providers. But the agency had not yet really addressed uh, the question about uh, high impact distributions. Those hospitals and those other types of facilities that are on the front line of the coronavirus. Uh, and so they developed another uh, round of funding, which has been called the high impact distribution round of funding. Uh, that was uh, distributed to those hospitals, about 395 of them, um, that had 100 or more COVID-19 patient admissions um, between January and April. Um, again, this was uh, in order to address the concerns by those hospitals that were seeing the brunt of um, paying for, excuse me, of seeing the brunt of addressing the coronavirus uh, pandemic, um, that they were not being adequately funded to address that. Uh, many of the, these billions of dollars went to hospitals and in, in the cities I've just talked about, uh, New York, Chicago, uh, Detroit, um, uh, New Orleans to some extent, and other major cities. Um, so that, that was a, an attempt to address that. Since then, there has been a second round of, of call for high impact distribution, and the agency has made plans to distribute some of these monies um, out to the uh, provider community who is high impact, uh, who have been highly impacted by uh, treating uh, COVID-19 admissions. There was also an allocation made for skilled nursing facilities, about $4.9 billion in May. Um, that was given to these uh, skilled nursing facilities because of the, the perception that they were also uh, on the front line of addressing the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, we've seen the stories, we've seen um, the uh, and many of them may have relatives in skilled nursing facilities and understood 
um, the impact that the virus has had on treating patients, uh, also being a sort of stopping place for patients who are um, leaving patient hospital admissions after being uh, treated for COVID. Um, they maybe need a resting place on the way to being entering the general population. These skilled nursing facilities have seen an uptake in patient admissions as a result of that. And then finally, on May 29th, the agency um, decided to issue about a half billion dollars of funds to um, Indian tribal hospitals and clinics uh, and other types of urban health centers uh, to address the problems that they have been seeing and, and to provide some funding uh, for them in, in response to the pandemic. Now, What's probably of most importance to this audience, of course, is the most recent round of funding, and I'm going to discuss that in a second. Um, do this round of funding, um, in some ways, I think could be seen as being, it's not necessarily a targeted distribution. It's not being given to uh, providers who have um, significant amounts of COVID uh, inpatients, for example. Uh, it's not being given to uh, you do solely to uh, tribal facilities, um, but it's a more general distribution. Um, and that general distribution essentially is to go out to any type of Medicaid or CHIP provider. So going back to the beginning of the distributions of the relief fund, um, I had said that the agency initially wanted to jump out and provide as much money as possible um, to providers that they felt were most uh, affected. And the best way they had of doing that was to identify all of the Medicare providers and get funds into their hands. And that's what they did with the general distribution. You see here on this slide, that first um, general distribution of $20 billion. Um, CMS, excuse me, HHS essentially wrapped that up um, and said by June 3rd, um, everybody who felt that they were entitled to uh, money through the general distribution to Medicare providers had to have all their applications in uh, by June 3rd. That date has come and passed. So that general Medicare distribution um, timeline is now over. Um, I also referenced earlier that there was a, going to be another round of, of funding for high impact hospitals and other facilities that have, um, uh, have, have seen a number of positive inpatient admissions from COVID. Uh, the agency has now put that in process. Uh, but most significantly for this audience, uh, the agency has finally opened up a, a, a pipeline of funding that can be driven towards um, dental providers. And the way they went about in doing that was to say that they're now going to make $15 billion uh, a, a, available from the relief fund uh, to providers uh, who are eligible who also participate in the state Medicaid and our CHIP program, and significantly that have not received payment from that first round of general fund distribution. So if you were one of the people who, uh, one of the providers that was fortunate to be identified through the Medicare program and you receive general distribution funds there, you're, you cannot receive general distribution funds through the Medicaid program distribution. Only those who were essentially left behind uh, now are, are eligible to get those $15 billion of funds. Um, the deadline uh, for this application is July 20th. Um, if you go to the HHS website or if you Google HHS Provider Relief Fund, you will be taken immediately to the page uh, that HHS has set up for the Provider Relief Fund. And on that page, uh, you will see uh, essentially a number of uh, options uh, to click on, and one of them is for providers. Uh, and if you click on for providers, it will describe each of the various um, distributions or categories of distributions that I've just described. It'll talk about the general distribution uh, and how that works. It'll talk about um, the targeted distributions to uh, hotspot hospitals. It'll talk about safety net hospital distributions. And then finally, it will talk about the Medicaid and CHIP safety net hospital distributions. Um, and so if you click on that link, uh, it'll take you to all the applicable um, documents that you will need. What you will need um, is first, um, you will need, there's an application uh, that needs to be completed and sent into the agency. That application will then enable you um, to uh, enter uh, the provider relief portal uh, 
and establish a username. Uh, and once you establish a username, then you can follow the application instructions uh, to begin to provide the information that's necessary for the agency to be able to determine whether or not you are eligible for those Medicaid um, uh, provider relief funds. So I'm going to transition now and talk a little bit about, at this point in time, uh, as to what sort of the strings are that are attached um, to the uh, use of these funds. Um, let's say that you're a successful provider. Um, you're a Medicaid provider, you're a dental provider, You've gone in, um, you've identified um, the, um, that you are, in fact, the eligible provider. And we're going to talk a little bit more in, in a moment about exactly how you will know whether or not you're an eligible provider if you're a, mental, if you're a, if a Medicaid dental provider. Um, but once you get in there, you're going to be asked um, to ultimately uh, attest to a set of terms and conditions. And that's very significant for you to pay attention to what the terms and conditions require of you. Because um, if you do not comply with those terms and conditions, uh, there could be consequences. Uh, there could be recoupment of funds. Uh, there could even be, you know, potentially uh, accusations of fraudulent use of these funds. So let's spend a little bit of time going through the terms and conditions uh, and how they work. Um, again, um, just to let you know that um, as you work yourself through the provider portal, um, ultimately at some point in time, um, you're going to be asked to attest to your acceptance of the terms and conditions uh, for retaining whatever monies have been provided to you through the provider relief um, distribution here, the Medicaid distribution. Um, it's obviously only uh, for eligible providers. Um, the, what we'll be talking about um, is in the terms and conditions, what they describe as the permitted use of the funds and the non-permitted use of the funds. The terms and conditions discuss um, reports that you may be responsible for uh, completing and providing to um, the federal government in order to let them know how you use these funds. It notifies you that they may, that you must retain records and that there may be audits in the future of how to use these funds. And then there's also a number of additional um, conditions upon which uh, you accept these funds and you agree that you will not use them. So a classic one would be you cannot use them uh, for example, um, <clears throat> to engage in any sort of prohibited lobbying activity. You will only use them to cover your expenses uh, and your loss of revenue uh, attributable to the coronavirus. So again, the initial tranche or what we call the general distribution fund of providers uh, relief funding, um, those, those providers uh, essentially didn't need to um, go through a portal initially they were just given the money it was in their bank accounts um, the medicare program knows their bank accounts because they pay them on a daily basis um, and those funds were a portion of those funds were just distributed in them those providers had to go back um, and agree after receiving the money that they would in fact um, com comply with those sets of terms and conditions and they were given 90 days from the date they received those funds to sign that attestation saying that they would comply with the terms and conditions um, if they had not, uh, within 90 days, the default rule was HHS would assume that they um, agreed to comply with the terms and conditions. They could keep the money, um, but the HHS was, again, going to assume that they were going to comply with all the terms and conditions set forth in, uh, under the program. Now, let's talk a little bit about the Medicaid and CHIP distribution that you, um, as dental providers, are now eligible for. Um, Again, if you went to the HHS website, um, you're going to be provided, uh, there, there are three to four sets of documents that are important for you to look at. One uh, would be a set of instructions uh, for the Medicaid application. Uh, the second is the application itself. Uh, the third is called, um, what the agency has called frequently asked questions. And there's a, page, there's a 37 to 38 page set of frequently asked questions that are updated on a daily basis. And when I say updated on daily basis, I really mean that. I, every day I check the website, I go back and I look uh, to see if there's any new, um, any new answer that if, or question that's been posed by the agency and, and answered. Those terms that are set forth in the frequently asked questions answer lots of questions about how uh, to complete the application, um, should you be confused by certain things. 
Um, those frequently asked questions will also tell you the basics of like, for example, who is eligible for the various uh, distributions. And there's a portion of those FAQs that um, address the Medicaid and CHIP distribution. And so if you went to those, it would tell you uh, who's eligible. Let's go over that. The providers who are eligible, again, are those who did not receive general distribution funds, i.e. those Medicare providers, and um, you're one of those, uh, and you build Medicaid and CHIP, um, the Medicaid or CHIP programs, uh, or you could have built not just to a fee-for-service program, but also to a Medicaid managed care plan or healthcare-related services from January through May of 31st of 2020. So those, those from January 2020 to May 31st of 2020. Um, so that, of course, would uh, include most dental providers in the United States. They'd be eligible. They'd probably build to either fee-for-service Medicaid or Medicaid MCO. Um, they were providing healthcare-related services, and if they did it in that window, that's step one of their eligibility. Um, so when must you apply? You have until July 20th uh, to submit the data that's required by the application. And part of the information that that application is going to require is going to require um, uh, tax information by which you will uh, be able to demonstrate to the agency um, what your gross revenues are. Because that's the, what the agency will use uh, to determine the amount of money that you will receive from this $15 billion fund. Um, they're looking for information on um, your, your tax revenue or your tax returns and the gross revenues from that uh, for either calendar year 17, 18, or 19. Um, you can determine which one you want to provide to them, um, but they will look at the gross revenue portion of that, and that's you're essentially going to be capped at 2% of your um, gross patient revenue. Now, the agency and the FAQs also say um, that um, the final amount each provider will receive may be affected by other data that's submitting, submitted, including information about the number of Medicaid patients that these providers serve. Now, in theory, the federal government has that information as to the number of Medicaid patients. Um, so once you've completed this application process, they've discussed the, the idea of that you're, you'll receive at least 2% of your gross revenues. You will also be asked for information about loss revenue. So in addition to providing tax return information, they will ask for you to estimate what your loss revenue was for a particular period of time. Um, and the agency has said that when you think about estimating what your loss revenue was for, say, March or April or May of 2020 that's attributable to the coronavirus, um, you're permitted to look at any sort of past budgeting or projections that you had used in, your, in the prior year to um, you know, take the delta between your budgeted number and what you've actually received to come up with a lost revenue amount. Um, now, in theory, once you've completed the provider uh, as a station portal, um, and you completed the application by July 20th, uh, you will then begin to receive funds from the agency. Um, you are not going to be required to attest at the time that you apply for the funds, but they will require you to attest uh, to the current terms and conditions after um, you have complied with, um, after you have received the money. So let's talk a little bit about how that attestation process, again, is going to work. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that the application that you provide and the attestation that you are going to be required to um, agree with uh, is what I would call taxpayer identification number or TIN specific. What do I mean by that? Um, reference back to what I was talking about with the application where the agency wants to see your gross receipts on your tax returns. They want that by tax identification number. And they're going to provide the, the amount of revenue um, to a taxpayer identification number. So in other words, they're thinking in their minds that the eligible provider is a, an entity that has provided a uh, tax return through this tax identification number. So you, those who, you know, wherever the, the bank account information that is linked to that taxpayer identification number is, that's who is going to be receiving these funds. Um, that's also who will be attesting to these funds. 
So you could be an organization where um, you may have two or three or four or five or 10 provider numbers um, that all roll up into one consolidated tax return and is filed under one taxpayer identification number. Um, that organization will be attesting to those funds and that organization will also be receiving those funds. But if you're a provider, say for example, solo practitioner who has um, you know, his or her own individual tax identification number, you'd be re receiving those funds and you would be attesting to those funds. So again, it's organization specific as focused in uh, through the taxpayer identification number. What the attestation process really requires you to do is to say that um, you will comply with all the terms and conditions. We're gonna delve into those in a moment. Um, you recognize that the terms and conditions are material to HHS's decision to give you this money. Uh, that's important uh, because by acknowledging that you agree to comply with the terms and condition is material to the, the secretary's decision means that um, if you some way in or some way accused of uh, fraudulently certifying to these terms and conditions, uh, the secretary says your your statements there were material to me, so I therefore believe that uh, it's fraudulent and I can pursue fraud remedies against you. Um, the agency also wants you to know that if you fail to comply with these terms and conditions in the future, uh, they therefore have the opportunity and the power and the right to recoup those funds mm -hmm. from you. Uh, and then finally, um, the terms and conditions apply not only directly to, the, to, to who's receiving those, but all those sub-recipients uh, sub and contractors. So back to my, um, Back to my statement about the taxpayer identification number. If you are an organization that um, has several different provider numbers under that tax ID, that attestation applies not only to the organization that submits the tax ID, but it's also going to be binding upon those providers who are who are rolled up into that taxpayer identification number. So this is just a, an example of the attestation process that those um, providers who receive Medicare funds um, will be uh, were required to attest to um, back on January by, by June 3rd. Uh, they had to um, attest that they were eligible uh, because they actually billed Medicare in 2019. Remember that was one of the conditions upon which they received their money. Uh, they had to attest also uh, that they provided care on or before, excuse me, on or after January 31st uh, for patients who were to diagnose, test, or care for patients with possible or actual cases of COVID. Again, possible is a very expansive definition and literally means almost any patient. Um, they also had to attest that they were not terminated from Medicare. Uh, Medicaid providers are, are obviously going to have to attest to something similar uh, and that they're not otherwise excluded from any federal health care programs. Um, <clears throat> or that their billing privileges were revoked. So we know that this is the attestation process that the Medicare providers went through. Um, we also know um, that uh, for those providers, such as dental providers, who are going to be applying for the Medicaid tranche of funds, that they're going to have a similar set of, of uh, requirements that they're going to attest to. Um, and then to, uh, again, uh, focus in on the, the concept of who's getting this money. Um, if you are in a group practice um, or employed by a practice, you will not be receiving those funds. The employer organization, which is probably the taxpayer identification organization, that's who will receive those relief funds um, as the billing organization. Um, if you are in a group practice, um, individual physicians and, and I guess dental providers in a group practice are unlikely to receive the individual payments directly um, because you probably bill through the group and that's who the relief fund um, payments are going to go to. Uh, so you should look to that organization that bills, in this case, the Medicaid programs to identify the details of the Medicaid payments that you would have received or should be receiving to identify those accounts um, that would expect uh, relief payments for you. Now, let me round up here and talk a little bit about um, a, a little bit of a deeper dive on these terms and conditions because they are significant and I think all dental providers should be made aware uh, of what they say um, as 
as you move through the application process and decide whether or not uh, you want to agree to the strings that are attached to these funds. Um, we're going to talk about the permitted use of funds, uh, how these funds are not uh, to be used, and then we'll talk a little bit about the balance billing concept, which is probably uh, the most significant um, here. So again, the funds, uh, according to the statute, are there, there to, for expenses um, that you would use, uh, that you incurred because of the coronavirus or you intend to occur. So um, a lot of this probably isn't going to apply to dental providers, uh, but they would, as you see, with um, with larger providers like med like hospitals um, or large physician practices, uh, to the extent that you are retrofitting facilities, opening up new centers of operations, um, you know, increasing workforce and trainings, creating space where you can isolate individuals who come into your um, into your facilities. Those those would be permitted use, and those would be permitted expenses. So the funds could be used to offset the cost of all of that. Um, and in fact, uh, when you certify to these funds, uh, you will be asked to certify that uh, the relief fund payment will not be used to reimburse expenses or losses that have been re reimbursed from other sources um, or um, other sources of funding. So um, let me pause on that because I was a, a bit of a quick transition. Um, recall now we talked about that the, the, at the very beginning of this program that Congress appropriated these funds to offset expenses and lost revenue. I just covered the expenses portion. Um, you still um, are permitted to retain these funds if your expenses uh, do not uh, add up to the amount of money that you receive through the relief fund because you may have losses um, that far exceed the amount that you may receive from the relief fund. But as we also talked about at the beginning of the program, you are also going to um, certify that you're not going to um, use this money to um, pay for expenses or lost revenues that have been um, otherwise paid for by other programs. So for example, um, if you are um, taking part in a small uh, business payroll protection program um, or you're, you're involved in a FEMA program, um, you cannot use funds that the FEMA program gave you to pay for the same expenses and then claim those expenses under the provider relief uh, funds. Um, similarly, if you have a business interruption um, insurance program uh, that pays you for losses, you may um, find yourself precluded from being able to get coverage for your business losses uh, through the provider relief fund itself. Let's talk a little bit about balance billing. Um, balance billing is significant um, and it's something that's confusing um, and there probably needs to be a deeper dive, perhaps a program on balance billing alone. But let me explain the concept. Um, this does not come at all from uh, the CARES Act. This is a, a policy um, that this agency has decided to adopt um, as a string that's attached to the COVID-related um, relief fund. Um, balance billing essentially means, of course, that um, you bill the patient uh, for the balance of what is not covered by insurance. Um, the, as a result of the coronavirus, um, a lot of patients were forced to um, see um, healthcare providers or suppliers who were not within their, uh, necessarily within their networks. Uh, so they weren't within their HMO or they weren't within their MCO. Um, and the agency has said that, um, they, that they would like to have providers um, who are providing COVID-related care um, they are prohibited from balance billing those providers for out-of-network uh, cost. So the example would be um, a physician sees a patient, uh, provides COVID-related care to that patient. Uh, the physician cannot, um, the, the patient is not within the physician, excuse me, the physician is not within the patient's uh, commercial network, um, commercial insurance network. Um, the commercial insurer uh, pays uh, some or a little uh, for that. And there's a, a significant balance on the bill. Um, the COVID, uh, if, a, if that physician receives uh, relief funds under the provider relief funding program, uh, he or she is prohibited from balance billing the patient for those funds. Um, and the, um, the rationale behind that is um, that the agency wants to, uh, during the pandemic, uh, 
uh, doesn't want to discourage um, patients from going to see uh, those providers that needs to, even, and they may be blocked out of their network because some providers are just no longer available. Um, this may or may not be a big issue for the uh, dental community. Um, it has happened with some significant frequency um, in the acute care hospital setting and in the physician setting. Um, and, and I have counseled patients, excuse me, I have counseled um, providers as to how they should uh, identify when there may be a potential balance billing problem. Um, but it really, the reason it may not be a significant uh, problem for the dental community is it only applies when you're providing services to somebody who is a known COVID patient and you're provided COVID-related care, or they're a presumptive COVID patient that you're providing COVID-related care. And a presumptive COVID patient is somebody who um, the medical record would suggest that they have COVID even though they don't have a positive um, COVID diagnosis test in their record. So since it's linked to providing um, those types of services, uh, excuse me, since the balance billing requirement is linked to uh, those who are providing uh, COVID-related care, there is probably not going to be a significant number of uh, dental providers who are going to be caught up in the need to assess whether or not uh, they're, they're caught up in a balance billing problem. But the balance billing issue is significant. It's a significant term and condition um, for the receipt of these um, provider care relief funds. There are, another, um, there, there are a number of other uh, significant uh, conditions uh, that under the terms and conditions that uh, dental providers should be aware of. I'll only discuss one or two more before I turn the uh, program back to Allison. Um, but the first, um, first one to be concerned about, I think, is, and we've already really covered it, that um, you're acknowledging that you're going to only use these funds to cover your expenses. Uh, and losses attributable to the coronavirus. So if at the end of the day, um, you receive more funds than your expenses or your um, losses, uh, then you may be in a situation where there may need to be some reconciliation and some return of funds go back to the agency because you are capped at what those expenses and losses ultimately are. The second term and condition I think it's worth uh, focusing on is that you will have to, at some point in time, provide reports uh, to the um, Coronavirus Accountability Commission, uh, or I think it's actually called the Pandemic Response Accountability Commission. This is created by the CARES Act, um, and it's essentially a grouping of inspector general types who will be looking into whether or not the federal government appropriately distributed funds and whether those funds are being used as required by statute. Um, and the terms and conditions speak specifically to the fact that at some point in time in the future, uh, the Department of HHS will provide uh, some mechanism for you to report back uh, the amount of funds that you received, the expenses that you're using those funds to offset, and the losses that you're using those funds to offset. So they, there will be some point in time where um, those reports will be looked at by the Accountability Commission, uh, and there may be some audits associated with that as well. So as you are going through and determining whether you, you have COVID-related expenses, whether you have COVID-related losses, always bear in mind that the time to account for those in an appropriate fashion uh, and to make sure that you have all your documentation orders now, uh, because if you do receive these funds, you will be preparing a report to the Accountability Commission, and there's a high likelihood uh, that there will be some review of those. Um, and if you cannot document um, your expenses or your losses, uh, there will be some return of funds. So that sort of is it from my perspective for the high level review of what the terms and conditions require. I'm now going to turn it over to Allison, uh, who's going to talk about what may be coming up next for more provider relief funding. Allison, do you want me to, do you want to take it from here? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, and Mark, if you would advance to the next slide, um, when you add up all of the different components and different distributions of the provider relief fund that um, have been announced to date, that leaves, for those of you counting and keeping score at home, that leaves about $65 billion of the $175 billion remaining and not yet spoken for. 
how this remaining money is distributed is the subject of a great deal of interest, as you can imagine, from stakeholders and from members of Congress who authored and supported this funding. The members of Congress are hearing daily from their constituents about how the funds are getting out into the community, who's hurting, who's been left behind, and who needs to be taken care of in the next tranche. Um, these members have communicated with, written letters to um, HHS Secretary Azar urging, uh, in some cases, particular segments of the healthcare provider community that have not yet um, gotten the benefits of the fund or, or, or need to be, um, have further attempts to make them whole. Um, they are trying to address those specific concerns. In addition, members of Congress are seeking greater transparency in who has gotten this money, where has it gone, what's the sort of final accounting tally. And this is for a couple of reasons. Um, it is both to understand where the funding that is in there, you know, sitting in this fund, where it's gone, where the remainder should go um, to properly address um, what, what healthcare providers have had to do to respond to this public health emergency. Um, it is intended to provide a bit of a roadmap should future additional funding be needed. And as Mark alluded to, it is important for oversight. Um, members of Congress, as you can imagine, want to understand where the money has gone and, you know, to the extent their constituents or, or particularly segments of their um, healthcare community um, have, have not been taken care of, they want to know about that. And this is all relevant, sort of this um, understanding, this transparency. It is all relevant, frankly, because if you look in the June um, 9th HHS announcement, the very last line of the HHS press release notes that HHS, and we've got the quote here, is working on an additional allocation to distribute really broadly to dentists. So having, it is helpful that Mark went through all of the steps and all of the strings um, that are attached because there will be another, um, you know, according to HHS, there will be another um, announcement and perhaps not limited to um, just this space. There may be others. So it's important to understand how the program has evolved and developed um, and stay tuned both to Henry Schein's website and to the HHS Provider Relief Fund website to see what comes next and what you are eligible for. And with that, I think that concludes our program. I don't know that there are any specific questions, but we would be happy to address any. Thank you, Mark and Allison, for your time today. Um, are there any important um, next steps that our customers should be taking right now while we wait for more information on this topic? Well, I'll go first with that, Natalie. I think that um, if if you are interested in the CARES Act Relief Fund, I, I would I would definitely take a tour around the HHS website. Um, you will not uh, not every question that anybody has will will be answered. Um, it's it's not as scary as it sounds, but um, you know you can easily download the instructions. You can easily download um, the application form. Uh, and review those. That's that's the first place to start. Uh, where it starts to get a little um, hairy is when uh, you start going through the terms and conditions. Uh, there's a lot of legal um, language that's used in the terms and conditions. There's a lot of cross-referencing to other statutes and other parts of the program. Um, and that's where I think a lot of people's concerns start to come in and start to try to understand um, what, what best um, it is, uh, that, or to try to understand exactly what those terms mean. Um, but yeah, I, I would start off with going to the website and, and doing a little bit of self tutorial there. Okay, great. Uh, the only thing, the only thing I would add is um, to the extent that you are um, finding that that uh, distributions aren't haven't reached you yet, or you are in need of something, I always always encourage folks to reach out to their members of Congress and let them know. Um, you know, the next COVID package is being developed. Um, members do want to respond, and that, I just I think that is helpful to share with them how this funding is translating in the real world. Great. Well, thank you both very much.
Um, I'd really like to thank you for your time today and your valuable insights on this really important topic. Um, and for our listeners, we hope you found this information to be helpful. Please visit the Henry Schein Paragraph <laughs> page for access to the most up-to-date information and helpful links to learn more about the funding available through the CARES Act. Thanks for participating today.